enough to have this man on the program with us a couple of weeks ago, and it was just so fascinating, and we didn't even get through a third of the book, that I was hopeful that Doug would be gracious enough to come back, and uh, the author of Doomsday is back. Doug, thank you for joining us. How are you, sir? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can, but let me turn you up a little bit, and that'll probably help everything. There we go. Yeah, it's my fault. I had my soundboard turned down. Silly me. Ah. It's all good. It's all good. Technology. It's a beautiful thing. So how the heck you doing? How's life just in general for Doug Woodward these days? It's good. Uh, By the way, let's see. I need to probably turn down something because I'm getting feedback. Mm. So how do I avoid that? Let's see. But in general, life is good. 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 Um, It's interesting. I don't know in your part of the world, but what I'm finding in our part of the world and on our program, and I've heard this from other pastors as well, that right now, financially, Christians are getting hammered, just hammered. And uh, uh, it it just seems as though Satan is using the, the geopoliticals these days to really beat on a lot of God's people. I think the rain does fall on the just and the unjust, don't you? <laughs> Certainly Christians are, are experiencing a lot of the same problems. Yeah, yeah, amen and amen. Well, uh, for folks who maybe didn't uh, hear the first interview, let's uh, let's not spend a lot of time, because I want to spend a lot of time talking about the book, but just a, a brief <laughs> biography of Doug Woodward. Who are you? Who are you? Sure. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm a guy that uh, grew up in Oklahoma, I've uh, been a management consultant and systems consultant most of my life, although I started off in the ministry uh, in the Methodist Church, Presbyterian Church, uh, Reformed Church of America, um, and have been uh, served as a, oh, you know elder member of the consistory, things like that throughout my career, but I'm mostly a technology guy. I've worked with Oracle, I've worked with Microsoft, um, I've worked with Ernst & Young as a partner, so I've spent a lot of my time focused on finance, uh, entrepreneurial things, small companies, startups, and um, so I've uh, been very involved in in uh, in entrepreneurship. I would say that's kind of the main thing I've been doing, especially the last ten years or so. And uh, so I live up here, uh, just next door to Redmond, Washington, uh, the home of the evil empire. And as it used to be called, I'm not so sure if it's still evil or not. Depends upon whether you're really a uh, an Apple fan and hate Microsoft. But uh, nevertheless, I was at Microsoft for a number of years. My daughter works at Microsoft now, so we're sort of a two generation family, I guess you could say. And um, anyway, so uh, I've been studying, uh, kind of from a you know theological standpoint. I've been reading and studying ever since I was 15. When I was 15, I had cancer. And uh, I lost my left leg to a very nasty form of cancer that uh, had, oh gosh, maybe no more than a chance for, let's say, 8% chance of recovery. And uh, was able to make it through. And, and once you go through something like that, you sort of feel like you have a special calling. Um, but I, I studied uh, a great deal through school. Uh, a lot of religious philosophy and theology. Wrote a few couple of books that I didn't get published back in the back when I was in my 20s, just because at that time there really was no internet, and no alternative mechanism to sort of get sure. yourself out there. But in the last oh, two years, I've written two books, working on a third, uh, and uh, the book that we're going to talk some about is Decoding Doomsday which is uh, somewhat of an encyclopedic work uh, covering sort of all of the popular discussion points of Doomsday, certainly 2012 being a big part of that, and, um, and of course, a number of other topics. And uh, I know there's a couple of topics that you want to drill into tonight, and uh, so we should probably get to that if you'd like to. You know, that, that was probably the, 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 the most flowery way I've ever heard anybody actually come forward and confess they were a geek. It was, <laughs> yeah, totally. It was, it was well done. I, I used to say I was actually in a fraternity. I, I wasn't so serious in it, so I used to say I was four fifths of a Greek. I was a geek. There you go. And it turned out to be true. It turned out to be true. Uh, my, um, uh, we, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but my mother-in-law also worked for Microsoft. Just retired a little bit ago. So, 
Uh, the, oh, okay, good. The biggest thing good. I missed was the family discount. Boy, you could uh, you could get some <laughs> great programs at a real good price. But uh, anyway, that's, that's absolutely true. And as alumnus uh, at Microsoft, you still get the opportunity to uh, go into the company store and buy software at about oh probably about an eighty five percent discount. She didn't so it's, tell it's me nice that. Benefit. She's holding back on me. Okay, that's all good. I tell you, I'll Look have up. to I'll have to share some software with you with yeah. you sometime. Look up. Okay, so. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier before you got here tonight about a lot of things, not the least of which the 2012 and the, the paranoia that exists, mm -hmm. uh, are, I think, around the world, really, uh, towards this whole phenomenon. Um, how, mm -hmm. how big, how crazy do you think it's going to get over the course of the next 18, 20 months? I think it's going to become a fairly significant thing. Um, I believe that the financial uh, issues that are going on, they, you know, they hit everybody right where it hurts, which is the pocketbook. And so everybody's wondering why in the world are things so bad? Everybody will say things like, gee, we've never seen it like this. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm sure it's not as bad as it was in the Depression of 1929 and the few years thereafter. But for us, certainly it's our, our time of depression. But I certainly think the financial factors are going to be a big, big thing i think that we're, we're already seeing some enormous you know climate climate changes uh the flooding in australia some of the just the very strange tornadoes that we're tending mm -hmm. to see nowadays in the winter season in february is becoming a big month for for tornadoes never was that way before um so you're seeing some massive changes there there's there's certainly great fears that some of the worst case scenarios as it relates to earthquakes to uh, what could happen with the solar maximum mm -hmm. that is supposed to hit late in 2012 or early in uh, 2013 that uh, that we could have uh, great cataclysms and of course much of the material written around 2012 really focuses on some of these uh, some of these cataclysms and um, and so I think that there's unfortunately a likelihood that there will be um, you know some unusual, uh, natural uh, catastrophes that is going to cause many or will cause many folks to believe perhaps this is an apocalyptic time in which we live. Now, I think most uh, believers in uh, the Bible as the source of prophetic uh, things that we can rely upon would say, hey, 2012 is not in the Bible. 2012 is not when the Lord will return at the Battle of Armageddon. Those that believe in the in the pre-tribulation rapture might say, gee, the, you know, the Lord may be coming at any moment. We're seeing so many things fulfilled that we were looking for back in the 1970s and 1980s when we first started reading things like uh, how Lindsay's late great planet Earth and so forth. We've been watching fulfillment of all kinds of prophecies and and so now we're we're beginning to say gee it's just about all there there's you know what else needs to happen that that would uh, you know uh, keep us from uh, seeing the, the the typical apocalyptic scenario that evangelicals have been sketching for gosh now well 150 years but certainly in our lifetime since about 1970 and uh, you know there really doesn't seem to be a lot that that needs to happen it seems like it's it's set up to occur now so so i think the anticipation is uh, is pretty staggering and is going to become more so uh, as we move into 2012 and certainly some of the predictions that that uh, one of the most uh, interesting predictions that very few people know about and certainly not not discussed in typical 2012 secular you might call it literature is a prediction by the zohar sort of a jewish mystical book that may have been written as early as the second century my rabbi friend uh, daniel lapin tells me uh it's traditionally thought to be, have been written in the 13th century but the zohar predicts that uh sometime in the year uh, 5773 the jewish year 5773 which happens to work out to the gregorian year of 2012 that there will be a meeting of world leaders in the city of rome and a comet will hit the city of Rome, will destroy the city of Rome, will kill many of these world leaders, and uh, will be the moment at which the Jewish Messiah appears on the, machine, on the scene. And of course the question is, is that Jewish Messiah uh, the return of the Christian Messiah, or is it in fact a new Messiah that we might, Christians might uh, uh, label the Antichrist. So there, there is a very specific foreboding uh, prophecy, if you will, that uh, that is something to look for, and goodness knows for 
the sake of those folks in Rome, uh, we wish them no evil, and we hope that that's, that prophecy is not true. S. Douglas Woodward is his name. You can call him Doug. And buy his book, Decoding Doomsday 2012, is what we're talking about. And, you know, Doug, I'm listening to all the things that you're listing. Uh, just before you came on the program, we were looking at the fact that it appears that Syria may have reconstituted their whole nuclear initiative. Uh, you look at the Bible mm. where it says mm-hmm. that Damascus will become uninhabitable. Uh, read mm-hmm. Israel nukes them. Um, we had Stan Deo on earlier this week talking about that just the scientific reality, some of which you touched on. And then we, we add into this element now all of the, the, um, the, the well, we're going to get into this whole new world aspect. And the, 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 it strikes me that it's a, almost a dangerous time in the sense of a lot of voices and knowing which voice to listen to. Oh, I think there's no question about that. If let's assume that for a moment that the Lord tarries and that uh, that the second coming uh, does not happen for 50 years or or more, uh, just making that assumption for a moment, uh, which could be true, by the way, I don't believe it is true, but it could be true. Um, there are a lot of, uh, of fearful things that we see. Certainly, uh, the rise of um, of Islam. Um, it's, uh, for the most part, um, I, I still believe it's far more than a small few, but it's a subsizable, uh, perhaps not a majority, but a significant uh, number within Islam that, that um, you know, believe that to be true to their faith, they have to uh, kill the infidel. Um, there's certainly a lot of fear that uh, Islam is, is overtaking uh, the populations in Europe and will outpopulate the Christians uh, over the next several decades and will have a dramatic impact upon life as we know it uh, in Europe and uh, not quite as much in the U.S., but almost the same phenomenon. So you have that going on. Then you have a smaller segment, which I've written some about, um, that's a very vocal uh, segment based on kind of a Hinduistic view, New Age view that is captured within the 2012 movement, I call it, because it's much more than just predictions about what's going to happen in 2012. It, in fact, is a another um, label we can, we can pile on top of so many others, uh, the New Age movement, if you will, that uh, are predicting that there is coming a moment of crisis in which those that are not uh, cosmically tuned in at the right resonance or the right frequency, they're likely to get banished from the face of the earth. And of course, I've suggested that might be sort of an anti-rapture theory, mm. that uh, it might be a useful theory for those that aren't raptured to explain what happened to those that are. And uh, you see this uh, a lot um, now. Uh, you can see certainly... Uh, uh, a number of videos on YouTube and so forth. I'll, I'll try to find the reference here in a moment in terms of some of the, the names that are applied to this, but uh, I've written quite a bit about it and some articles that have been published on Tom Horn's site, Raiders yeah. News Network, right. which is where another, another place where you can also get the book, my book, as well as some of his great books. And um, anyway, so there's, you know, you have those factors going on as well as just the population bomb itself. You know, if you look at, you know, where would the population of the world be in, say, 50 years? Well, it's going to exceed 12 billion people. And you begin to think about that and all the implications for the world. um, And you really begin to wonder if Mother Earth can sustain a human population like that. So, you know, there's a good question from just a purely scientific standpoint of whether or not it's likely that some kind of of horrible virus or some other form of plague could even uh, occur that will kill off perhaps billions of people. And so there's, there's worries like that, that those kinds of things could occur. And then there's even more awareness nowadays of um, some of the phenomenon discussed in the 2012 books, the, the possible eruptions of these massive cauldrons such as what under, uh, it lies under Yellowstone Park, um, the, the possibility of being hit by comets. We're seeing that more and more frequently as our science gets smarter and is able to detect the objects that are out there flying around in space. And so um, there's just all kinds of fears. So it's, it's, uh, it is a time of doom and gloom, I'm afraid. And um, I, I, think I bet Christians people believe, just really love go ahead. to... So, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I bet people just love to sit by you at a social gathering, don't they? <laughs> 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 oh, Mr. Doom well, and Gloom know, over there, run away. Ask me, 
<clears throat> That's right. If you ask me what we can hope about, I, I would say, well, there's actually a lot of things we can hope Amen. for, but I think it, it begins with our faith yes. in beginning to believe that it's through the power of Christ um, and his watchfulness over us that we have to have to base our hope and our faith and yes. stay calm Amen. and stay reassured. Um, it doesn't seem to matter who I talk to these days. Uh, whether it's so-called Christian X-Files, whether it's uh, just some of the, the geopoliticals that are going on and the roots of them, if it's the Muslim Brotherhood and the fact that uh, this group of happy guys got a hold of them in the 30s. The Nazis, the Nazi philosophy, um, Nazism, even I, I see uh, one of the top skinheads in the world was assassinated today. Um, hmm. The, the the Nazism actually has a few fingers on this whole 2012 New Age hubbada hubbada <coughs> that you 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 do a great job mm -hmm. of explaining in your book. And when I first came across it, or you intimated that it was there, I thought, oh, you got to be kidding me! These guys are everywhere. <laughs> well, it's true. I've uh, I've studied that extensively. It was interesting last night. History Channel had a had a program on uh, Nazism and the occult, and so I was, you know, eager to see what it is that they would talk about and how far they would go. And yep. of course, they they hardly even scratched the surface sure. of the truth of things. Uh, remarkable how uh, little they talked about what really is the truth about uh, about Nazism. But uh, perhaps I can just make kind of a broad statement that we kind of dive in if you sure. want to if yep. you want to look at some of the details. Broad statement: um, the the kind of core philosophy that was going on at the end of the 19th century. Um, there was uh, there were a lot of occultic things happening, but mm -hmm. the probably the single most important thing was the formation of a group called the Theosophy Society, which was founded in New York City uh, in 1875 by Madame um, uh, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, known as HPB, and uh, and then uh, another interesting gentleman, Henry Steele Alcott, spelled O L instead of Alcott. Um, and uh, which is another famous uh, New Englander, I had a daughter that wrote Little Women, I believe. But anyway, um, anyway, the uh, the the story of Theosophy uh, fills in so many uh, factors into what was involved in the creation of Nazism and its rise in the night from 1917 until 1925, where Hitler was was very influenced in so many ways which we can talk about um, but nevertheless the uh, the bottom line was that that philosophy shaped uh, new age thinking the the mother of the new age is Alice Bailey uh, Alice Bailey influenced a guy named Benjamin Krim who's still with us today uh, they're what I call the hardcore New Age people they they believe in a um, in a coming Messiah Lord Maitreya um, and even though this is a, an idea that, that existed even in the 19th century, uh, and there's even uh, some of the occult space, sort of space uh, nut ideas, uh, a book called The Only Planet of Choice that talks about uh, sort of the channeling of nine different voices that talk about their arrival back on Earth, some of which will predict that it's in 2012. Um, but you find this thread all the way through from theosophy all the way to today and you see it very much in the middle of the 2012 movement in the discussion of higher consciousness um, and indeed it's true that probably 80 percent of the folks that write about 2012 are really writing about a time of transformation hmm. not an apocalypse and uh, we can talk about that as well if, if we have time but uh, essentially they're they're saying that there is a time of transformation coming in which human beings will will obtain higher consciousness they will be able to converse with entities which we might call demons uh, and that we they will begin humanity will begin to work with them as if they were uh, just uh, you know working with a side by side and they were visible all the time um, and so uh, anyway this this concept of higher of uh, higher consciousness of powers of channeling of even Superman such as Nietzsche talks about all of this stuff is wrapped up into uh, the, the theosophical ideas that were at the core of uh, what got Hitler believing that he could conquer the world and dominate the world 
Well, and, and then he takes these beliefs, all of these occultic New Age beliefs, and he starts sending people off all over the world looking for, you know, the, the Holy Grail, the Ark, you name it, it seems, they, and, and mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. kinds of other occultic symbols and devices that I'm not even aware of. But what I'm starting to glean and understand is that as much as I thought they were into the occult, they were into it a lot deeper than I realized. And I'm not trying to be kind of weird here. It's just they mm-hmm, were. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were big time into the whole mysticism, uh, talisman, whatever they could find as far as uh, relics that, that might give them power. Hitler was all over mm-hmm. it. Absolutely. In fact, we might even just do a little uh, kind of parenthetical deep dive for a moment on uh, kind of this linkage between the occult and, and Hitler and kind of where it began. Uh, we can talk a bit about the uh, the mountain climbing uh, Tibet experiences that Brad Pitt brought to us in seven years in Tibet. But, um, but looking at the kind of the origins of this, there was um, a group called the Golden Dawn that uh, were a group of folks that were <clears throat> very much into into magic sort of in the 1890s and uh, this group was eventually led by a guy named I believe his name was Co- uh, uh, Samuel Mathers I won't say Cotton Mathers but that was a uh, that was a Puritan I believe yeah, yeah. Uh, Samuel Mathers um, and Mathers um, channeled um, these what were called the white the white brotherhood the great white brotherhood the adepts from uh shambhala uh in tibet on the ethereal plane i don't hope i don't lose all your reader or your listeners here but anyway um he basically uh, believed in very deep magic and the ability to influence spirits and even the the visible world through this powerful magic um, this led to Aleister Crowley, who we probably most people have heard of, who uh, was the so-called beast, uh, who used that name to describe himself. He broke off um, from, the, uh, from this group um, and formed his own group. Um, and um, um, it, this group became extremely perverse and got into some extremely dark and deep uh, black magic, sexual magic, and so forth, which is really not even appropriate to go into because it's so gross. But um, they were very influential. And then the, uh, the key guy that, tie- that connects Aleister Crowley is a guy named Dietrich Eckhart. And you hardly even, for instance, even the last night in the, uh, the the show on the History Channel, don't even mention his name. But Dietrich Eckhart was actually the person to whom Hitler dedicated Mein Kampf, and uh, which was his, of course, his uh, Bible, which would says uh, my struggle. Interesting that jihad is also the word for struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, Mein Kampf was dedicated to this guy named Dietrich Eckhart, and Eckhart was uh, very much into occultism and um, was initiated into many of these black magic rituals of Aleister Crowley. Um, and uh, by the way, just a quick side look, Crowley's house was where supposedly Robert Plant and Jimmy Page wrote uh, Stairway to Heaven, just to bring it to a current, th- wow. <laughs> current point in time. I have not um, heard that. And you may remember that, that whole story. But anyway, um, Eckhart uh, taught Hitler many uh, rituals as to how to influence powers and how to uh, manipulate them into doing what you wanted them to do. And so Hitler was, was uh, taught uh, very deep occult truths that go well beyond uh, any occultism and Freemasonry and some things like that. In fact, Hitler even made fun of Freemasonry that it was like choir boys when it came to the occult. Um, that uh, you know they were just barely touching on one ancient wisdom and so forth that he was up to his earlobes in. So um, so nevertheless, the turns out that the, um, the the German Workers Union from 1917, which Eckhart founded, um, and uh, and also there was another uh, German Order of the Teutonic Knights, which just became known as the German Order. By the way, whose whose ins- uh, insignia was the swastika. Um, this led to the Thule Society, which is a really interesting 
uh, belief or occultic group that led uh, ultimately to the formation of the of the uh, German National Socialist Party, otherwise known as the Nazis. And these things all happened over a period of just really a few years, three or four years, in which one group sort of you know, gave rise to the next, and they were basically all the same people that were involved in these. And Hitler was right in the middle of all of this. There are a lot of authors that, you know, that will sort of poo-poo that, but the, uh, the research I've done suggests that they're basically naturalists, and they just can't believe that anyone... Um, smart could possibly have gotten involved into something like the occult, and so they tend to deny the the rather obvious historical facts uh, just because of their premise. I think so. You have that's kind of where Hitler begins sure. in terms of his occultism. S. Douglas Woodward is our guest. If you go to survivormall.com, you buy his book there and do get his book. Okay, um, this is a closed question, Doug. I'm going to ask the okay. same question as an open question when we come back, but sort of as a tease right. as we head into the break. Can you mm-hmm. draw a line from Hitler and the Nazis to where we are today as far as the modern New Age movement? Mm-hmm. We, can, we can certainly talk about that. Now, do we want to take a break then? We do, sir. So you're going to get to uh, right. just put your feet up for a second or two, and uh, we'll be right back with Doug. Again, go to SurvivorMall.com and pick up his book, Decoding Doomsday. It is brilliant, and it reads like an encyclopedia as far as all of these cults and occults, and it's like, wow, I can't read the book in one sitting. It, it's it's bite-sized. But it's one of those books that you will keep referring back to as far as, now, how does that group fit to, oh, okay, it's brilliant. It is just a fabulous book. I heartily commend it to you. That being said, I am going to take a break. When we come back, more with Doug. If you have questions, email me, vdj at crossing-the-world.com, or if it's easier for you, crossing the world for Christ at gmail.com, either will work. Jump into our chat page. I'm monitoring our chat page. If you've got a question, pop it up there. If you're my Facebook friend, instant message me. And, of course, our Davis Cellular text line, 417-844-5412. You can't say it's hard to 